Episode 10. Hi everybody, I am Ignacio Rivera. I'm Mandy Rivera. And this is Pure Love. Tell us about Pure Love. So Pure Love is um, uh, our web show that g goes over um, talking about sex, relationships between parent and child, um, and how multiple conversations about sex and different aspects of it can help combat and prevent child sexual abuse. Yes. Thank you. And today is a special um, episode. It's episode it's 10. Special. So it's going to be just a little bit longer. Uh, I hope that um, you like it. And so what we decided to do was, since we are the ones talking a lot about our relationship and how uh, we talk to one another, talk about sex, um, building on our relationship and using sex education as a life skill, we wanted to talk to other parents. So we, uh, I talked to my sibling survivors who are fellows in the Just Beginnings Collaborative. They are other folks, uh, survivors of color, who had the opportunity to create their own projects on combating and ending, ultimately ending child sexual abuse. So we are going to have today with us Luce, Tarana, and uh, Tajmika and their children. So, um, how would you describe your relationship? Um, like, how do you interact with one another? Would you say you were friends? And how do you communicate? So, for us, um, so we want to ask that answer that question as well. Um, yeah, how would you describe us? I would say that um, our relationship is always a work in progress. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that we're always working at to grow together, to better ourselves separately as well as collectively. Um, and I'd say that we, I guess we communicate very in a modern way, like, you know, texting, video chatting, <laughs> emails, everything. But, um, we have a millennial relationship. Yes, we have a very <laughs> modern relationship. But um, I'd say that because we, I feel like because of our the way that we, think about things or view the world, our communication is different than maybe other parent-child situations are. Because um, I know like you always taught me to like see someone else's perspective, to think about things before I react, you know, just little things like that that come into play in any type of relationship. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I often use words like, uh, my daughter's my best friend, it's the most important relationship in my life. Um, like the love of my life, I'm older than mi vida. I have a tattoo on my arm that says that. Um, which arm is it? Yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's. I, I would say our relationship is like the most beautiful thing and the most challenging thing, right? Because we're always learning one another, and there's that balance between friendship and parents, right? So I think at one point I would say that we were kind of codependent on each other. <laughs> And um, even noticing those things and kind of talking about how we want our relationship to grow and change. And that's one thing I, I really love that we actually have an opportunity to change our relationship when a lot of parent-child relationships kind of stay the same. Yeah, that's what it is and there's nothing more you can do. You just navigate around. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm really happy about that. And yeah, exactly. like the way we communicate is that um, Marco Polo texting, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I want more FaceTime, you yes. know, that's why you're visiting more and <laughs> yes. stuff. Like, I love the FaceTime more, but I appreciate, you know, all of our connections in, in all of the ways. And I also always look forward to every chapter that we're going to go through. Like, mm. now that I'm getting older, the next big chapter would be, you know, children uh, moving and mm. nesting, all that stuff. So I look forward to doing that with you as well. Yeah. And, you know, just a, like a little uh, plug... Our next couple of episodes are really going to get into kind of a, a little deeper and older kinds of conversations around uh, sex. You know? So, so let's hear what everyone else had to say. How do you interact with each other? Okay, girl. What? I just feel like it's weird because I don't necessarily live at home. At home, 
Right. So we text. Oh, yes. We, we, text, call, we call. We email. Yes. We visit each other. Yes. No? Yeah, we do. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but it's hard. It's not always easy because I'm not really a good communicator. Um, yeah. So I do think if we think I'm about sorry. like as a child growing up until now, um, how we interacted with each other, um, there was a lot of obedience. Um and discipline established. Um, I never spanked you past five. Right, but you don't have to tap it. You, there's other ways to establish discipline. Like, there's rules and things mm-hmm. like that. Um, you know, like, directives, you know, um, like that. Um, and so, which has made me very rigid <laughs> growing up. I just, yeah. well, it's not a bad thing. Oh, all right, all right. Well, I, 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 wanted, I do want to say you're the person I call to the gossip. Yes. About all types of stuff. Yes. So, um, you know, and and I do appreciate that you helped me think about when I have to discipline your brothers. Mm-hmm. Um, I do call for counsel and I do call you for counsel. <laughs> um, and I should say I do have a husband. I didn't I'm not a single parent. And um, and I do seek him for counsel, too. But lots of times it's, it's my right hand person. Yeah. I know when you left for college, I had fun writing you those emails. Oh yeah, yeah. I had fun writing you the emails. I don't know if you remember them. I titled them "What I Wish I Was Told mm-hmm. About College mm-hmm. That Nobody Told Me" or something like that. And I think I talked about sex and all types of things in there. I think so. And then also after college, though, my communication not just with my mother, but like with my family, became a lot more frequent. Like mm-hmm. just like calling home and stuff. Um, so after college, I spent two years in Providence, Rhode Island, working for AmeriCorps. Um, um, an AmeriCorps job called City Air, and um, I would just call home all the time. I visited mm-hmm. home. Like there was some times where I would go two months, and every weekend I would be home. Um, whereas even though I went to college in state, I never came home. Mm. I spent summers in Rochester. Yeah, but I would visit. Mm-hmm. I drove to Rochester. I drove to Providence because um, wherever she goes, I want to be. <laughs> I would describe our relationship. It's very friendly. I feel like I feel like we're best friends, honestly. I mean, with the still like clear cut line that you're my mother, yes. But like, I just I've never <laughs> I've never not felt like I can come to you about anything. So I've never never felt like you were in a safe space for me. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I think I would describe our relationship in a similar way. You're my favorite person in the whole wide world. Um, obviously I feel very protective over you, so the, the, the line of distinction between like, oh, this is my best friend and this is, I don't feel best friend though. And I don't mean that in a, I don't mean that in a, you know, you the love of my life. I feel like, um, my friends are my friends and then you are like my universe over here. This is kind of like where I exist. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I would describe our relationship as, but we also have an adversarial relationship a little bit too. Like as you get older, you, you kind of you kind of buck up a little bit. No, I, I a little bit. I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, anything um, I got, I got from you. So that's not the point. I'm just saying our relationship. We have a good one though. We I do. think we Very work solid. through. Even challenges really well, right? Because we don't really stay mad at each other. No, like for more than like I think the longest we stayed mad at each other for was like a week. I don't even know what you're talking about. No, it wasn't even a full week. Like what are you talking? About? I don't know what you're talking about. Anyway, <laughs> okay. Um, how would you describe our relationship, Isaiah? Um, with love. Um. It's easy for me to talk to you. Uh, you're my mom, you know what I mean? So, I love you. So it's a good, um, healthy relationship. I love you too. I think we talk about a lot of things. I think we hang out a lot and talk about music and politics and all kinds of stuff. I really like that about our relationship. And I feel like we laugh a lot too. <laughs> Would you say you were friends? Yes. You think we're friends? Yeah. We're not. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> we 
are friends for sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first question is how do you relate to mom? Like how do we get along? What is mom to you? A cuddle party. You. <laughs> I'm a cuddle party. Yeah. We are cuddle. We, we are big on cuddling. Um, is mommy like your friend? Do you feel comfortable talking to mommy? Mm -hmm. So our next question was, have you ever conversed about sex? Um, how? When? What topics? Was it hard? Uh, did you feel good about it? Did you do it once or did you do it over several times, etc.? Um, so for us, um, how would you describe it? <laughs> that was... I'd say that it wasn't just one time. It was because right. it always comes up in one way or another, whether it's not directly like intercourse or you, you know, physically doing something with someone else, but about your body, about noticing other people's bodies or why is this happening or, you know, like just changes that you notice, right. like feelings that you're noticing. So that's a lifelong thing. Like in kindergarten, you might notice it. In elementary school, it gets a little bit more. Middle school, it's stronger. High school, it's like, oh my God. So that's your whole life that you're a sexual being that mm -hmm. you need to have multiple conversations about, even if it's about holding hands, kissing, right. eye contact, anything like that. Like anything that pertains to We're still to that. talking about it. Yeah, even now. <laughs> so I'm just like, you know, it's always a conversation that is going to be constant. Mm -hmm. You know, I've always had we've always talked about it in some shape or form whether it was about anatomy biology anything like that you know um and i've always liked it because i like being informed i don't mm -hmm. i hated when i spoke to friends or cousins or something and they just had no clue and i'm like it bothered me i'm like how do you not know these things and i'm like thank <laughs> goodness i have my mom i'm like why don't you know these things this is your body but so it's i'm a very tough blessed call. Yes. It's a tough call. yeah so for me, um, I would say, I, I'd say the same. i say, but I think in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, when Mandy was probably up until like age four or five, I think I've said this in interviews and in essays and all that, I was an absolute mess. When Mandy was around four or five or something, I was really struggling through my survivorship and really didn't know how to talk to her about her body. I was just led by fear, led by fear. After that, it was the beginning of a beautiful, you know, um, journey talking about sex in a variety of ways, and I think the beginning was a little hard, uh, but uh, it's gotten better and better. And and I love that you have really, really, like, just started talking to me about you know your relationships now as an adult, and and even even then, you know, talking about love and and who likes you and who doesn't and all of that stuff so I, I, I'm liking that we continue we continue to have these conversations you yeah. too <laughs> so let's see what uh, both a parental unit and offsprings had to say about their conversations around sex well because I always wanted you to be like completely different than me so I will yeah. say that I love that you are more open than me. Mm. I love that you are not embarrassed about anything about your sexuality. Um, I love that um, you were like filled with like so much confidence. Um, I think because of this, because of the nature of your work, we've always been in um, centers that provide some type of services, mm -hmm. like whether that's services um, for for testing, mm -hmm. for counseling, for whatever. Um, we've always been places mm. that. Um, provide services, um, and also kind of focus on people of color. Mm -hmm. And so I think, and um, my mother, she always like introduced me to people and said, you could talk to so-and-so about this. You could talk to so-and-so about that. And so I never felt like I definitely mm -hmm. didn't have anyone to talk to. And then where we went, we were getting pamphlets for stuff. And this is like when I was young, um, like in elementary school, um, my mother's um, old job, she's, uh, I mean, I guess she still does travel, but um, it just always, always required traveling. And so she would always try to take um, either me or my brother. And so, um, we were just at these places where everyone was kind of talking about sex in some way. And so um, having those resources available and then having like all these pamphlets and just like hearing stuff. Um, mm. I think that's kind of where a lot of the education came from. Um, but even when I was younger, this I didn't know. Um, when, my mom, when my mother used to do, I don't know what the work is called. Um, we used to pass out condoms. Oh, I used to volunteer at the Council. Okay, mm. yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, you and your brother used to um, make these little Ziploc packets yes, that yes. we would drop off yes. in the um, in the hood, mm -hmm, like at the mm -hmm. bodegas, and um, to just sisters, mm -hmm. working sisters, um, and and they were little sex 
Ziploc bag. Yeah. Yeah. And so we needed somebody to put them together. And so why not kids? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. I just had to make sure you knew they weren't candies that you could eat um, (laughs) because they look, you know, like little candies and stuff. But, um, but I loved it because, you know, as a parent, you don't ever know when to talk to you your kids and so I we obviously use TV and media mm-hmm. right so like shows like I guess Law and Order and Taken and Blackish but um but also the work at the AIDS Council because mm-hmm. me and Miss Tanger we used to do uh, sex buffets mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and we would show up at like black um black owned uh, and Latino owned clubs mm-hmm. and we'd take those little kids that y'all would put together mm-hmm. and would just sit there at a bar yeah. um while people were drinking and we would be talking to them about sex Mm-hmm. And, then, <laughs> and then um also my brother and I volunteered for Noun Voices mm-hmm. um for a couple summers, um, which provides services for LGBTQ people of color. Um mm-hmm. and uh there's just you know condoms everywhere, there's posters everywhere, people coming in, um, and just having conversations about uh sexual health. Um and we talk about sex really openly, I think. Yeah. This is been the way that I raised you really is that to kind of not like use the right words, use the right language, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, most of what you like literally taught me about sex mm-hmm. was like be safe, mm-hmm. don't do dumb things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was also it was a little heteronormative. So when I got into the queer world, I was kind of like. Well, I can't teach you what I don't. I mean, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I did try to buy you those dental. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god! god. I forgot <laughs> all about that until just now. That oh, I'm just saying. I taught you what I knew. I had no idea you would not heteronormative until you told me. So cut it out. Um, mm. Yeah, but how old were you when I first started talking? Do you remember? That? Like six. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't yet. No, it was like four actually. Yeah, I had, had the yet. first like version of the talk at like four. Yeah. Um, it was the news before you started started school? Um, yeah, it we was had, stuff like don't let people touch. You talking about consent and yeah. like you know personal space and boundaries and all of those things. Yeah. Yeah, and I feel like it's just been it just was layered on sort of um, year after year, and then I talked to you about like. I was kept waiting for you to lose your virginity. <laughs> I'm like, really? Oh, Why? Okay, that's cute. You waited a long time. I did. <laughs> I was actually pretty surprised. I thought you was gonna go for it at like 15. Um, I mean, you know. Uh, Do you remember the first time we talked about sex? No, I don't remember that because I already like, knew way past when you first talked to me about it. What it was. <laughs> Like, I didn't need you guys to talk to me about it, and I knew what it was. How did you know? I watched movies. I interacted in the world around me. <laughs> I knew what it was. <laughs> but do you remember when we sat down for the first time? No. When we were on the porch? And no. we talked about it for the first time? No. no. Was, what age was I? I don't know. It was a couple of years ago. I just remember that it was my first time having a conversation with him about sex, and that we giggled our way through, like, the entire thing. Like, I don't... <laughs> It was like, ew, gross. No, no, we were just, it, it, we were talking about it, but it was like, I, I don't know even why it was so funny, but I remember you giggled, and then I would say something, and then I would giggle, and then you would say something, and then you'd giggle. So it was just, <laughs> <laughs> it was just funny, the way that we kind of went through it. Yeah. And then I provided you, I said, here are some websites if you have any questions. Mm-hmm. That you can, but I feel like are safe, so you can look at by yourself if you don't want to ask me, but that you can always ask me any questions that you might have. That's what I remember. Clearly, you don't even remember this. Remember the websites. Um, remember talks. Like I just don't remember the. I, I feel like I've had a talk with you on the porch before. I can remember that. I just don't remember the specific words that were, you know, the yeah. dialogue to that whole thing. So. Yeah. But I think that we've talked about it more than once, though, so that's probably why you don't yeah. necessarily remember. It wasn't like this one time where, you know, we talked about it and that was it. It's reoccurred, you know what I mean? So I, I, we've talked about it, like, more than once. Yeah. We talk about consent a lot. Uh, yeah. And we've talked about... Safe sex. Safe sex. 
Right. What else have we talked about? Uh, appropriate times. Appropriate times. You know. Uh, especially with consent, like it has to be consent. Mm -hmm. So even if someone's drunk or something, it's really important that you don't take advantage of that. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, along with consent, there's that too. Yeah, for sure. I think those are the two most important things though. That we've covered consent. so far. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. I think those are the main things that we've talked about. Have we, have we talked about sex? Do you guys feel like we've talked about sex? Yeah, we have. Uh, how? How have we? Like, in a joke, but serious way. Kind of like a joking serious. It's kind of like a- Jerius! Jerius! Jerius. It was Jerius. It was Jerius. So Don't like, worry. not too serious, but, but not, not too jokey either? Yeah. Okay. How did you feel talking about it with us? It's an Weirded out. Weirded out a little bit? It's an awkward topic because you don't talk about it much. Yeah, that's true. It can feel very awkward. Yeah, it can. <laughs> mm -hmm. I feel like we haven't, we've spent a lot of time talking about your bodies and how important it is that you can say no if you don't want people touching you and that you know to stop if other people don't want you touching them. So we've talked about saying, is it okay for you to say no if someone wants to give you a hug or kiss you or touch you in any way that you don't like? Poke you. Poke you. Is it okay for you to say no? Yes. Yeah. Okay. What do we call our um, our private parts? Um, our penis and our butt. <laughs> and nipples. And we have nipples well, and breasts and vagina. Mommy has a vagina. And that feels awkward to say a little bit for me, by, doesn't it? Okay. So how and when did you come out to your child as a survivor? And how did you understand or feel about your parent coming out as a survivor to you? Mm. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember exactly. I know that I was doing the show. I think it was a little bit before that. I'm trying, I oh, feel yeah. like I was around like eight or nine or something, I think. I think I didn't really know what to say because I was scared that I was going to damage you by saying something or I didn't want you to feel um, trauma, a secondary trauma because the person you love has been hurt by another person that you know. Right. So uh, I was afraid of that but I think I started out by saying um, this person hurt me. Um, they hurt me in these ways and it's affected me. Um, and no detail or anything. Yeah, no and, detail. And I think later on, um, when you were in your pre-teenage years, maybe 12 to 13, maybe, um, I was, I can't, I have to do the math, but at <laughs> some point in your teenage years, uh, I was touring with my show, Lagrimas de Cocodrilo, Crocodile Tears, and that was the show that was really talking about my survivorship and the, you know, talking about my family and how how I navigated through that and my uh, sexual orientation um, at that time. So yeah. I know you emailed me I think like a piece you wrote about it mm -hmm. or something and it was like more detail about it but to be honest I still have yet to read it because I have it's like one of those things that you would need to prepare yourself right. for. It's like right. if I'm if I'm gonna watch like uh, what is it Precious I have to be like okay this is right. what's happening right, I'm right. gonna cry I'm gonna be upset but it's just a movie like you know like I have to tell myself that but this is different because it's not a movie mm -hmm. um, but for me when you explained that you were a survivor I remember being I felt so hurt for you very mm -hmm. angry um, I had a like a lot of rage toward it but then I'm just like as a child you know it's not my place and what am I supposed to do and who's mm -hmm. gonna listen to me or you know like anything like right. that but you know of course in my head I'm just like a protector of you so I'm like if anybody did anything to you they need to die like they don't need to be around <laughs> like <laughs> lights out you, and I remember you said I'm never speaking to that person again never and it, it, it has it's been since that point I've never spoken to them I'm just like there's no need like if you can do that and continuously do that and like generationally do this to people I have no need to have you around right. me like right. 
you hurt the most important person in my life to me. So there's no way I could ever forgive you for that. Mm -hmm. Even if you've forgiven or moved on or whatever, to me it's just, it's a closed book. Mm -hmm. So I just, and it hurt me too that somebody so close to me that I love so much went through something like that. Because, you know, it's usually far away from you hear it in the news or somebody right, right. who's not as close but I'm like this hit really like close to home to me and I'm like damn because like you know you hear stories about CSA or somebody was molested or those incest in the family but then when it's in your family you're just like shit mm -hmm. so it kind of like yeah. it shook you it shook me a little bit especially because I'm like this person has access to me access to my cousins right. like so I'm it made me nervous I was like mm -hmm. I don't know how to navigate with doing that as well especially because mm -hmm. I'm like you know like how family members make you feel if you don't want to talk to an adult relative. Right. They force you, they push you, like, that's your family, why are you not? And I'm just like, I have my reasons, I don't want to get into it, I just don't want to do it. Right, right. But, um, I feel like it made me understand you better as a person, about your choices and mm -hmm. the work you do, just how you raised me, everything. It made a lot of sense mm -hmm. about just everything. Hmm. Oh, that's good. I thought I was driving you crazy at one point. <laughs> I mean, like, there were certain things that I was confused about, but I'm just like, I get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah. Like, this is your journey. I understand. Okay. <laughs> I've always come out as a survivor, but I don't think I was always clear. I think, um, I think what I would say to you all when you were really little was like, somebody hurt me when I was little and I don't want you all to be hurt. But I don't know if that sunk in or not. I honestly remember that. I mean, what do you remember? Have, I remember just increments. Um, mm -hmm. and by middle school, we knew what was up with something. Mm -hmm. um, so middle school was like 12, 13. Mm -hmm. um, think, and then I think it was in college that I learned about the abortions. Yeah. 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 But, You're right. It was in increments. I kind of tried to think of what would I want to hear? Mm -hmm. How can I tell you and not hurt you so much? Yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously I made you paranoid so that I didn't quite do that as well, but, 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 but so it was an increment mm -hmm. and also it was based on where I was. Yeah. And so when you were all born, I didn't work on ending lines and I used mm -hmm. to work with people with disabilities. And so I knew I was a survivor, but I wasn't as, um, presence about it you know like I didn't articulate it out I would have been embarrassed to mm -hmm. um dad knew but like other people didn't mm -hmm. wouldn't have known um so uh, I think after this I feel like my I just like switched into like ultimate obedient high gear and so like when we were talking about um mm -hmm. like never having like a rebellious like phase or nothing like that I think that this really contributed to it because it was just like how dare I not listen to this person Oh, um wow. that's really um and so it was just a lot of like um yeah just like listening and doing oh wow um it felt i don't i, I don't I never necessarily felt like oh my goodness i couldn't help i don't think or ever felt like um uh like angry to the point where i couldn't necessarily speak mm -hmm. or anything like that mm -hmm. um but I remember just thinking, like, how dare I not listen and, like, di and, like disrespect my mother, um, which also actually made me very mm -hmm. upset at my brother, who often would just, like, not listen and just, like, not follow directions and just, like, whatever. And so I would ask, I'm like, I'm like, how, like, like how could you just not listen? Like, she's asking you to do something and you're not doing what she's asking you to do. Um, and so mm -hmm. that's really, I think, the biggest thing. Oh, wow. I came out as a survivor to you when, probably after um, the incident at Jubilee, maybe? Mm -mm. I didn't know that either. No. Mm -mm. It was after I told you. When we had that like, big, a big talk. We had a big talk. Oh, so you were 11. Mm hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. Just nine years ago. Because I'm 20. How did you feel? <laughs> Well, I guess it was a lot of feelings. It was a whole lot. It's just, I thought, okay, I thought what she thought. I thought I was completely by myself, and I was the only one this had ever happened to. I mean, realistically, I watched Law and Order. I know I wasn't the only one this had happened to. <laughs> but, like, in my head, I was like, this is it. I'm real person. I'm the only real person this is happening to. And then, like, because I looked up to you and, and still look up to you so much, and... When you told me your story, I just, I felt normal. Like I didn't feel like, 
it was just me in this little bubble of pain and I was just going through this by myself and no one was ever going to understand how I felt like you you put into words the things that I felt that I had no words for and like when you were just, you told me your story with so much just like I don't know it was the way you told me your story you had this like wisdom I guess in your voice that was just like it gave me so much hope for my own future like I actually felt like I could be happy I mean that's the whole it's so interesting because that's really like the reason why I do the thing that I do and I use my I realized at some point that I was reaching these girls who I was working with and I, and I wasn't reaching you. Like I knew, I knew something had happened, you know, as we've had this conversation, but like I knew something had, had happened and I, I pounded at it for years, years. <laughs> asking the same questions over and over I again. I saw it as a rock. Yeah, and not, but it was like one day, excuse me, um, a light bulb went off and it was like, oh, wow. I felt this way at this age because this thing happened to me. Perhaps she feels this way. Of course, she was she back then. <laughs> she feels this way. You know, this is the thing, the thought that I that I had, and um, and I just keep doing that so I can see your face. Oh. Um, and so I thought, oh, I should approach this the way I would have wanted somebody to approach me, and kind of using the tools that I used. Um, for excuse me, um, the tools that I use for the girls I worked with, and so it was when I asked you, it was when I said to you, you remember the conversation? We were on the bus, right? No, we were in the bedroom. Well, we were like, because I remember like the conversation like started on the bus on the way home from like that's possible grocery shopping or something, and then we got home and we had like the big talk. Yeah, but it was in the I remember sitting on the bed in the bedroom, and I said to you, you I was doing your hair. And I said, you know, excuse me. There's nothing you could do that could separate you from my love. That's exactly what I said. Oh, that's exactly what I said. I remember. There's nothing you can do that can separate you from my love. Nothing. Oh no, I'm emotional. <laughs> and then it was because what I remembered is that I felt complicit when I was young and I thought if you feel the same way you'll think that if you that I if I know that I will love you less or you'll be in trouble and I'll feel differently about you and so I wanted to really drive home that there's nothing you can do to make me feel um, differently. I don't know that I so much as came out to Isaiah because like with the little ones they they well even with Isaiah when he was younger I told them the same story that my dad hurt me and now I help kids who have been hurt too. But then as you got older, I started bringing you to things and you started to kind of hear more and know more. Yeah, I feel like it's something I just always know. Like I don't, like same with the, you know, other questions. I don't think it was as much like one thing. I feel like I've just kind of known it. I don't remember when the first time I heard about it was. I just feel like I kind of always knew. So I did not come out. Um, I mean, me and I actually had no idea no. until she told me about this video, so. Yeah, we didn't talk about specifically my survivorship. We just have told my little ones, mm -hmm. right, that mommy's dad was not very good to her mm -mm. and that now I work with kids whose parents or who He's changing the future. <laughs> Reframe the future. That I work with kids who have been hurt in similar ways. So the next question is, how did your survivorship impact um, talking with your children about sex? And for the offspring, did your parent coming out impact your understanding of sex or your sex life slash experiences? What about, what about you? Like, did that, like, I, I know for me, like, my survivorship absolutely impacted <laughs> me talking to you about sex because at first it was through fear, but then secondary and most and best was that because I was a survivor, I was like, you are going to know everything. Mm -hmm. You are going to know about your body. You are going to know that you have the right to say no. You are going to know that no adult 
can tell you what to do and I often remember saying to you you know even me you could say no to even me you know um, and giving you other parameters to get help um, to, you know via a, a lot of different people and mm -hmm. stuff so I know that because I was a you know survivor that, that it was super important and, and that drove me to give you all the tools that you needed because I didn't have them and I didn't know what the hell was happening right so that's how you know that my survivorship impacted that I feel like your coming out as a survivor impacted me very positively because of all the knowledge and information that I have about myself and others and things and not being afraid to seek information or ask questions or whatever but I and I and, and like in a way where I'm very vocal about things and or I don't tolerate certain things because you know a lot of um, like women or young girls don't speak up or they don't know how to ask for what they want or you know they don't say what their boundaries are or things like that they don't have conversations so because of the way you raised me it's all about conversations and in the beginning I'm always like this is this that is that we can negotiate this this we cannot mm -hmm. I am not okay with this what are you not okay with you know right, like right. to make sure that everybody is enjoying themselves in a safe clean environment you know mm -hmm. things like that so it made me um, have more conviction conviction I guess mm -hmm. and not just letting things happen right and right. be taking control of my sex I guess right or Yay. things like that <laughs> so it was positive um. for me. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that um, <laughs> and you know just to say like a lot of I think a lot of um, girls young women or, or young people uh, and even men but I, I'm really highlighting young women here it's like the socialization the socialization of like you know be good you know uh, be um, be a good girl or don't do this and don't do that so that these words really impact and and I think really teach some women young ladies girls you know that they can't say they can't say what they want they can't do and if they have information then that makes them a slut so we really have to be careful around that because even if my mother wasn't a survivor and had never gone through these experiences I would still have a living experience as a woman um, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, creates my own perceptions of, of sex um, and interacting with um, like uh, universities that do like trainings and like you know like the news and the media that mm -hmm. um, is always like talking about uh, um, sex, uh, sexual health, um, sex ed, um, all these sorts of things mm -hmm. where um, at some point like something was going to affect it so I'm not necessarily sure if mm. this did, um, I guess I learned about unwanted sex, mm. uh, which is not sex. I learned about rape and, and, and sexual assault, but I learned about sex through sexual violence. I, I, I think I'd rather say that yeah. because I had to learn about sexual violence would mean that I would have to know what sex is, right. which makes sense to say that I learned about mm. sex through sexual violence. So, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that I've always felt, I, I mean, if anything, um, my mother's experiences in conjunction with the work that she's done for violence against women has made me feel more comfortable with talking about it mm -hmm. um, because I've just seen it. Um, we talked about and you know the conferences and symposiums and like mm -hmm. on phone calls and like and you know, like like and all this stuff that it's never felt taboo to use like actual like anatomical terms and like mm -hmm. you know like the vocabulary that we shy away from. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my survivorship impacted how I talked to you about sex because I was so scared. I was really scared that um, that the same thing would happen to you and I was really scared that I couldn't protect you and so I talked to you about sex early on so I really wanted you to understand right from wrong in terms of your body. I wanted you to have autonomy over your body. I wanted you to know that that was the right thing that you have the right to have autonomy over your body. Um, but I was, I probably was too hypervigilant. I'm like, oh, big. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in retrospect, I think I was hypervigilant about it and that might have drove you away a little bit more, confused you or pushed you in the wrong direction in some way. Excuse me. Um, yeah, so it definitely impacted the way I talked about sex. Um, with you because of my survivorship. It kind of impacted the way that I like went about my relationships intimately I guess because like I was all I was really 
there was a point where I was almost afraid mm -hmm. to like do anything or like be you know, every, everything felt like I don't know but the, the good thing that came out of it was that you did teach me that I had like agency over my own life mm -hmm. and you were like you can say no mm. whenever you feel like you want to say no and we talked about pleasure a lot we talked about like you have it has to feel good to you and you have to really want it and it's a beautiful thing when it's two people that are like we may love each other really in love <laughs> makes me feel sad you know what i mean that it's like a thing that happens in the world today i didn't know how bad it was so it kind of depends was it like really bad i didn't know about it kind of bad or just like barely noticeably bad it was it was pretty bad it was pretty terrible knowing that someone hurt mommy when i was little how does that make you feel can sad. you give me it makes you feel sad. 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 <laughs> to be completely pain. honest, I kind of want to tear out the stomachs. <laughs> yeah. Completely honest. Sometimes when people hurt other people, it does make us want to be violent, but we, we know that that's not the answer, right? Violence is not the answer. Violence, Violence, is, not the answer. Violence is not the answer, but I can understand you wanting to be protective of mommy. I really wanted you both to know that your bodies were your own and that uh, they don't belong to anybody else. Uh, it made me want to be more honest with them um, as, as they asked questions. I wanted to answer them honestly so that there was no like mystical, um, kind of like no mythology around their bodies and who should have access to them and when. I thought you were talking about like, like, like real myth and like, Zeus. No. I was like, I wanted you to have a clear understanding of your body parts. You can't sing right now while I'm talking. <laughs> I wanted you to have a clear understanding of your body parts and how you have control over them. And I wanted to answer all of your questions as honestly as I could whenever you asked them. Um, being a survivor, I know that sometimes kids don't know that their bodies are their own and sometimes that can add to the confusion if someone's trying to touch you and hurt you you don't know to say anything and i really wanted to make sure to talk to you guys about that do you think we talked <laughs> about that enough uh, i don't know you don't know i don't know if it was enough or it was too if it was too much well it depends <laughs> it might be too much we do talk about it a lot actually maybe like four day basis somewhere out there something like Four every times, four days. Every four days, you think we talk about yeah. it? Yeah. I do reinforce that your body is your own a lot. Uh, so, what's the next one? So, um, the final question we have is, how do you think conversations about sex um, help prevent child sexual abuse and help build intimacy and build your relationship with the parent and child? I mean, I feel like this is all we've been talking about in all the episodes. Every single like, one. <laughs> I am adamant about it. It's like, you know... Um, it helps to prevent, in my opinion, I feel very strongly about this, that comprehensive sex education, when I say, when I say comprehensive sex education, that means Everything. this really, really, really broad way of thinking and talking about sex, not the, when you, you know, fall in love or and procreation, yeah, and have a baby and if Marriage. you're a good girl and wait and that is one and that's not to say that that's a bad thing i think it's a beautiful thing when it happens if that's what you want right but that's one tiny way that people actually um navigate sex and relationships in this world right and so we have to talk about it in a really big way we have to talk about sex for pleasure masturbation uh talk about body image and i've said this before we have to talk about power and control we have to talk about oppression the interconnections of all that this is how we navigate the world this is how we you know we, we're talking to boys and we're talking to girls you have to include society sometimes yeah. religion everything goes into all the, of it all about of it, all half of it. the conversations lack of conversations anything everything goes into it right so it's like this is vital because the t it's the tools it, are, it like and I and I give this analogy a lot about you know like um, no, sex education is a is a life skill right so it's like um, you know, teaching your children how to bathe or brush their teeth or eat, uh, you know, properly. It's like you don't say, um, 
you know. You can you, skip over that. You'll learn it when you're older. Like when you when you're 18, you'll learn how to use a knife and a fork. You right, know, right. Like, or or you can say go brush go brush your teeth, but not provide a toothbrush or a tooth toothpaste. Or get in the mirror with them and show them, okay, you do it four quadrants. You brush here, then you brush down, then you brush yeah. down, you brush your tongue, you brush twice a day, maybe more. Like, there are things, right? It's like such a simple thing to brush your teeth, but most parents, most parents will sit with their children and do it. in the evenings and do it over and over and over until they get it right because you don't want their teeth to fall out, you want them to have fresh, clean breath, right? So. It's, it's, it's a tiny, a simple thing like that. We need to be talking about uh, sex education in that way that it is um, something that we have to model the way we communicate with one another. And, and always, it's always a topic of conversation. It's a seed you're planting. Like, right. just like if you teach your, like teaching your daughter how to wipe front to back. That little, right. that little piece of information exactly. could change everything. It's so true. <laughs> like, everything. Because I know adults who still wipe, like, back, back to, front. to front. And I'm like, what? Right. So I'm like, you missed that small little detail when you were small. And look at you now, 45, still wiping back to front. <laughs> so, and then you wonder why you have UTIs and stuff. So, like, just little lessons like that will make all of the difference. Like, any, any lesson you teach, really, not even about sex or relationships mm -hmm. or communication, but... Any lesson you teach can be so multifaceted and go into all aspects of life. Like, and then in terms of relationship building, I, I do have to say it's a great relationship builder. I, and it's very vulnerable. Like, okay, we can't deny child dynamic is a hierarchy, right? There is a hierarchy and that parents have power yeah. over children, right? And there are moments where in our conversations, I make myself extremely vulnerable to try to get, even if for a moment, to a leveling playing field with my child and I don't know if that's real or not but like in that moment at least to talk about my feelings about relationships I've had breakups and I've cried to my daughter and I told her uh, how it made me feel what I did wrong what I would do better next time I am showing her these things so that she could see oh wow Mommy mm -hmm. fucked up, and now you, can you know they're doing this this way, or being um, accountable, taking right. responsibility, and growing from your choices. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I'm showing all the time by sharing in that way, and that's I think that's been helpful. And when you share things with me, I am always happy because you let me into a part of your life that a lot of people don't share. You just kind of see relationships pop up, but you don't know the progress. You don't know what's yeah. going on, and I like to know that. I want to know so that I can say you know that person is fantastic for you or and that's nope. why I yeah <laughs> and that's why I let you know because I'm like I always put you like you are like up here to me so I'm like if Baldy says no then it's no <laughs> like when you were like when that person I was interested in you were like I don't think that person's all right and I was like all right cool okay. never supposed to be she calls me Baldy sometimes yes okay. Baldy is my name for my mother <laughs> nobody else called them that. because I used to be bald. what like for seven years or something I was bald yes or something. Okay. yes so, um, yeah, so I want to really get into, like, what other folks had to say about that. Is it helpful to talk to your kids about um, sex and um, sexuality? And yes. In order yes. To, is, that, is that the key to ending um, um, child sexual abuse or, um, um, I don't know. I mean, I definitely think it's one of the methods or, like, one of the practices that we need to engage in because there's also so much mis- um, what's that called? Misinformation. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. necessarily think conversations about sex prevent child abuse. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, it's a child and an adult. It's just like child, child abuse. Um, but I don't think that they prevent that kind of mean sex. It's a child Like if that. there's like um, a kid who's six and another kid who's like six right. and you know um, I think that that kind of brings about different conversation in which you have the opportunity to kind of like frame children experiencing their right. bodies in yeah. kind of a more positive way to say you know perhaps you know like 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 it's not wrong like these might be the questions right. that you're having or what's this but you know um when they're exploring yeah yeah when, they're, when, they're, when, yeah, when they're exploring because they're doing it because they have questions they're not doing right. it I don't I don't necessarily believe to inflict violence right. upon someone else they might be mirroring something mm -hmm. that they're experiencing, but I do think that it's a kind of exploration. Um, but I don't think that necessarily prevents child abuse. I think that it can, it's weird. I think that by talking to children about child abuse, I mean, obviously we knew that Awalita didn't have to watch us. And so, right. so, so if there's a child that, that knows that this is what I touch, this is what no one else's touches, like this is, right. you know, this, this is that, then a child can then maybe feel more empowered to vocalize, but not all the time feel that way. Um, I think it's less about 
giving the tool, the kids the tools they need in order for them to stop it. Because the idea is that it's a child, oh, right? Yeah. But it's more about, um, like, I always was excited when you would tell me these things. Mm -hmm. Because I'm like, oh, my God, if she tells me these things, then she'll always tell me. Oh, and okay. so even if I can't always be there to stop somebody from mm -hmm. hurting my kids, mm -hmm. they will let me know. Mm -hmm. As opposed to, I've been telling everybody, not since I was like, 28, 30. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's, um, I think it's, I think it's, it's, it's more complex and it's more nuanced. Um, but I think Ignacio is onto something, you mm -hmm. know, because I, I think it allows for all the conversations. And I yeah. I'm only having a one-sided right. conversation about what the bad stuff is. Mm -hmm. Then you don't ever get to see what the beautiful stuff is. It certainly makes yeah. it easier to have a relationship because I don't necessarily feel like I'm hiding anything. I don't feel like my mother's like necessarily hiding anything. Um, Anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Again, yeah. I feel like having conversations with you about sex made me more relaxed about it in general, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I, it made it normal for me. Like, I felt like I could come to you and be like, Mom, I did this. Or I could be like, Mom, I don't know what's going on, mm -hmm. but I feel like this was like, you know, I, just, I felt like I could come to you and tell you these things that were happening as a part of my sex life because I, I felt like, it was okay. Like it was, it was not a big deal. We've literally been talking about it for so much for so long that it just doesn't even feel like a big deal to me anymore. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I think the biggest privilege that I have is that if I come to you about something, you won't freak out. Like mm -hmm. you're never yeah. gonna yell at me and like start like calling me out of my name. And just, yeah, it's gonna be like, alright, let's handle it. That's not my model. That's not my my way of operating. So yeah, clearly I wouldn't do it with with my child. Now than the other two kids because now he's a teenager. You're a teenager now, so now the lessons need to be a little bit different. And so it gives me um, comfort that your the things that you remember are about consent and safety because you know I want to make sure that when you go out into the world away from mom and I mean even when you're still living under a roof that no matter what you're doing, that you're never causing harm to other people, specifically sexually, but just in general. I want you to be the kind of human being that respects other people and, and doesn't harm them. And so hearing you say that you understand what consent is and that and be able to describe it makes me feel good because as a survivor, that's something that was always really important for me to make sure that you guys understood. Um, it makes me a lot more sensitive to consent you know like that for me is pretty important like it would always cross my mind so yeah like that's pretty much what it's done for me it's just the consent base of everything you know what i mean why why is that so important um because there are a lot of problems if you don't have consent you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's not... Like, if this person doesn't say yes, then it's just not... It's not, like... First of all, it's not, like, true. It's not right. You know what I mean? So... You mean, like, I don't understand. You said it's, it's not true. Like well, it's like, if someone says yes, and the other person says yes, it's like, yeah, we both want to do this. If someone says no, it's not, like, right. It doesn't click. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that one person takes this person. You know what I mean? It's yeah. not. That's why I said that. Okay, just want to be clear. Um, I feel like if you talk about that kind of thing when you're younger and you grow up understanding that this isn't right, you know, and you grow up with the right uh, foundations of those conversations, you know what I mean? Like, if you're talking and you talk about this when you're little and you grow up, knowing all this that you're and you know this is wrong and you you know it's just bad that there's a less uh chance that that will ever happen or you know what i mean do you think our conversations about sex build intimacy between you and me or build up our relationship yes um because it's not if we never had talked about it in the beginning, and I had no idea what it was, if it ever was brought up, 
I'd never be able to talk to you about it like mm. this. Oh, I never thought about it that way. So, like, if you were to just start talking to me at this for the first time right now, I'd be like... <laughs> but you know what I mean? Yeah. So it helps that I've, you know, we've talked about it pretty much through my whole life when I was old enough to understand. And, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so that makes you comfortable enough to talk about whatever the next question might be. Yeah. I never thought about it that way. I mean, I think it's an important for kids to know what abuse is and knowing that they have power over their bodies, it empowers them. I feel like children who know what sex is helps them to be able to speak up if something inappropriate happens because they understand that no one should be doing that or trying to use their body in a sexual way when they're a child. Also, it helps them identify what is sexually. Yeah, and what is sex? Because you don't know if you're being abused if you don't even know what what it is, is what sex is. So you're like, it's kind of like looking at green beans for the first time. And you're like, hmm, what are those? What are those? And then if you don't know what they are, then you can't call them green beans. <laughs> <laughs> that having, I believe that having conversations about sex with your kids helps them to understand that it's not a taboo subject, and so. I hope that as you get older, you will feel comfortable asking questions whenever they come up, whenever you want to talk about it, because mommy wants to know, I want, I want to make sure that you know that I'm here for that and that we do have that kind of relationship. And then finally, we um, allowed uh, folks to just ask each other any random question they wanted um, just to, you know, tie things up. So let's see what... Um, parental units and offsprings asked each other and their answers. So, for a very long time, I've always wanted to know, I mean, you always say, like, when I see you do interviews and, like, when, um, or even when you talk about it in journey, you always say, I knew before I ever told you, like, you just said you knew, and I just, I've never understood how, because I really thought that I was, like, masking it well, and I mean, I didn't even remember for so long, so I just, yeah, so you were outside. I knew because I felt it. I felt it in my bones. I felt it in my spirit. I saw it in your face. And because you were my child and I just would study you sometimes, I noticed a, just an ever so slight shift in your personality. And I was trying to figure out what it was. I didn't know if it was because you missed your dad. I didn't know if it was because we hadn't moved. I didn't know what it was um, yet. And then I saw you. You were outside. I was... Um, would walk you to school when you were outside on the gate and a group of boys came running up who were like maybe a little older than you like you might have been in third second grade and they were in like fifth but they came running and the way the fear and terror on your face like like you were terrified and i thought that's so strange she's always wanted to go play with the boys and figure out where they're going and da 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 but you didn't, you didn't ask me for that, and I thought, okay, something happened. But, I don't know. Hmm. Do you have any real questions for me that you don't know the answers to? Uh, no. I, Nothing that you want me to talk about now? Let me see if I can think of a question. You get to watch me do my work, and you get to watch how hard it is sometimes and how sad it makes me sometimes and also how like empowered and happy it makes me but I'm just wondering what you think about my work and what I do um I think if you, if you were going to be in a non-profit profession that would be one of the good ones to join so I mean I think the kind of work you do is good and it helps people you think it's worth it? Yeah. Even though I talk to you guys about sex and consent every other day? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't care. Like like I said, you know, if you're, if you're like, I can talk to you because you talk to me so many times about it that I can start to just feel, you know what, I'm not, it's not awkward anymore. I can just mm -hmm. talk about it and it's like, just another talk, you know what I mean? 
So I want to thank y'all all very much for taking the time to listen to Pure Love and to engage and witness other families, uh, parents and children, adult children, talking about a really vital, vital topic that we should be talking to with our children, especially as we're seeing um, the climate of people coming out of the closet, so to speak, around sexual their abuse. sexual assault, sexual abuse, rape. It is all in the news, and I don't At want... At an alarming rate. Yeah, and like, I don't want people to kind of um, have all of those allegations and stuff kind of blend into the background like it's just something that happens. No, this is the time more than ever to really be talking about how this is an epidemic. Rape, rape culture is an epidemic, and child sexual abuse, and there is a clear lineage from child sexual definitely. abuse to being a survivor of adult rape. Right, either. All right, so we definitely need to be talking about this, and I'm, I'm really happy, and I want to say thank you to Luz, Tashmika, and Tarana thank for really you. sharing their stories with us and being vulnerable on the interweb um, to share. <laughs> so um, thank you all so much. Please send in your questions and your comments. We really, really appreciate yes. them. And you can check us out on uh, our YouTube channel, Pure Love Talks, or my website, igrivera.com. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Bye.